Hello. Uh, okay, so this one. Uh, friend, my, uh, friend of mine. My, uh, friend of mine that, uh, DMs the Earl Meyer game. I was talking to him yesterday. Just casually asking, like, hey, you got any idea? Anything you want me to talk about specifically for, uh, what do you call it? For rambling? And he sat there and he thought for a second. He said, traps. And, uh, I don't have a huge amount of thoughts about traps, so... Or at least at the time I didn't. So, um, gave it some thought overnight, and this video is going to talk about traps. But I'm also going to talk about how it relates to, like, basically everything else that your party might more or less encounter. That's encounters, fights, like actual combat and battles. There's puzzles, which are related to traps, but they're not traps. And then there's, um, you know, social, social interactions or like kind of social battles. That's a bad word. Not a very good descriptor, but cases like social conflict, where you're like trying to argue or convince someone of something. There's something stuck in the sleeve. That's cold. Okay. Anyway, I'll get it out. Of um. So, traps. What exactly are they good for? Basically, um. They're good for, say, I mean, you can use them for a lot of different things, but one of the main things they're good for is, or one of the main places you see them, are in dungeons. And they're there to present danger to the players that isn't a bunch of goblins with spears. Um, so that you end up at least you can threaten your players with something other than another combat. And there's always a few different ways that your players might be able to avoid such a thing. There's the, the classic example of, you know, your whole party's moving through a dungeon, and the rogue is going first because they're the most experienced and the most sharp-eyed at picking out what could potentially be a trap. You know, you walk down a long hallway, and there's a few... It's like a cobblestone floor, and there's a few cobblestones that are um, kind of sticking out of the ground a little, out of the floor a little bit, higher than the rest of them. So, oh, curious. So you go up to the first one, you investigate it, and it is disconnected from the, uh, you know, Rogue gives an investigation check. Oh, look, it's disconnected from the cobblestones around it. All the other ones are grouted together properly, but this one, there's a, there's a, a shadow line around it, meaning showing that it's disconnected. This is probably a pressure pad that will activate traps, and, you, and the rogue looks up. Like, let's say they rolled pretty good on their investigation check. The rogue looks up, and they notice down the hallway on each side, every six inches or so, let's say, there's a little slit. And it's really small, and it's actually disguised so that while you're walking down the hallway, you can't see them. But if you go down the hallway and then look at the wall to your right, then you can see them. Hmm, I wonder what those could be. But because the character, because the rogue caught it, you can your party can navigate around these pressure plates, and your party avoids that trap. You reward the player for both. Um, you reward your player for playing well, and that's good. That's game mechanics, playing the game. But, how do you, ex there's like a lot of different ways to exactly arbitrate that. Maybe, um, like let's keep this condensed to one character that's good at a, a variety of things, this road. So they have good perception. Based on their past, unless they say something, unless, if the player specifically says, oh, I want to look around in this room for traps. Okay, if they say that, great. You give them an active perception check, or they make an active perception check, and then let's say if they roll above a 14, they notice those cobblestones that are raised a little bit, and that can prompt them to make an investigation check if they choose. Or, let's say, instead, passively, 
if their passive perception is like 16 or 17, then they can notice that they'll notice those cobblestones passively. It's sometimes that clean, that's cleaner, but it puts a little more on you at the end. But it does reward having higher stats and investing in perception, which most players do anyway. And at lower levels, like at level four, like like levels three to five or so, that's going to be having that 16, 17 threshold. That's going to be a little tougher. Like, but a rogue with expertise in perception and a decent wisdom score of like two, at least 12 or 14, then they're going to have, a, what, a passive perception of, at level 3, it's going to be passive perception is 12 plus 14, so they're going to have passive perception of 16. So unless they have really special wisdom investment of 16 or higher, they're going to miss this passive check, even with expertise. At level five, then their passive perception jumps up to uh, 18, so then they would catch it. And you know, you want to tailor your exact values to different to players, um, players' abilities and stuff, but it's not super important. Um, so, in that case, yeah, you can reward them with the passive identification of these raised cobblestones. And then once you get into higher level, either you have more complex and more dangerous traps, or you have more of the same kind of traps that your car that your party can basically just invalidate and ignore for free. But if you're supposed to be challenging them, then you do something different. So maybe you have a blend of these things. If you know your characters can notice stuff passively, or when you walk into a room, you have everybody make a perception check. And if they don't make an active like, because this is a general check, you just walk into the room and give a check. Then maybe the DC is 18 or 19. But if the player states uh, specifically what they're looking for, either you give them advantage or you lower the DC. One or the other. They're, they can effectively be the same thing. It depends. Like, there's you know, ranges. Like, if you've got... If the DC is, like, reasonable, like if the DC is 16, and you give them advantage, that's pretty... They're, they're extremely likely to pass that. But if it's 19 and you give them advantage, it's not as... It might not be as likely. Or if you just lower the DC down to, like, 14, even with a flat roll, that's still relatively likely to go. It's like a 60-70% chance, depending on bonuses. At, like at that level, but not important. Um, so mostly, yeah, you use them there, and if the players don't catch them, then they take a bunch of damage, and then they have, or they take a, uh, something happens, and in that same example, they step on a pressure plate, then poison darts start spitting out, and then other character abilities start coming into play. That's, I think, a really good, another good aspect of traps, that they can test a lot of different player capabilities. They can test your perception and investigation checks to try to avoid them in the first place. They can, in this case, like, you know, okay, you make a dex save to avoid getting shot by these poison darts. If you, that rogue is likely to pass it, so they are likely to avoid, or stereotypical rogues, they're likely to avoid all those poison shots, and then they're fine, but the party might not. Like, you got a big dude in armor with no decks, he's, he's probably gonna get shot. But, so, you know, he fails his deck save, he gets shot, and then, let's say, the cleric also gets shot. Um, or, let's say, just everybody else in the party gets shot. The, but the, the rogue avoids it. And then, they take a little bit of piercing damage. And then, they have to make a con save against the poison. So, then the, the big soldier dude, he makes his con save, and so does the sorcerer. So, he's not poisoned. Or, so the, the fighter dude and the sorcerer, let's say, manage to avoid it. Avoid the poison thing. So, they just take a little poison damage, but they're not... Like, you know, say it's a, a save for half damage, for half poison damage and avoiding the poison condition. Okay, good. 
but let's say the cleric doesn't pass that con save. So he takes extra poison damage and he's poisoned. So we've got a choice. Either, let's say he's poisoned for an hour. He can either save his spell slot. Let's say he's prepared protection against poison, just because. So he can either save his spell slot, save that resource, and just kind of take a back seat and not, and like, you know, he's diminished for a while because he is not going to be able to uh, participate because everything he does has disadvantage. So he has to take a back seat and the rest of the party has to kind of take care of him. Or he can use his spell slot, cure his poison, maybe drink a potion to recover some of that damage. Well, you, instead of um, having your character diminished and in the back, you've used some other resources like your potions and a spell slot. That's also more resources you get your players to use. Or, going all the way back to the beginning, let's say that your players use a spell slot to detect the traps. Or they use some feature that I don't know about to detect the traps and avoid it. Okay, great. They just spent another resource to avoid this instead. Because best case scenario is the rogue, in this case, in this example, makes a, makes a few checks and they avoid the trap for free. Worst case scenario is everybody takes a bunch of damage and they spend more resources to heal up and avoid poison. That's kind of how, that's, that's like a relatively simple puzzle and that's kind of what they're good for for forcing players to expend resources. Then you've got uh, traps that are a bit more like puzzles. And usually you have some, you have to have some sort of time constraint. Like, you know, you your players walk into a room and as soon as the last player crosses the threshold, a door slams shut, the ceiling jerks and starts lowering. So they're gonna get crushed. And they have to figure out a way out of this room. And you know, let's say you have a way for them to get out laid out. Um, and let's say you planned it out meticulously, or you just threw in some features that as long as they interact it with in a way, in a satisfactory way that you are happy with, they get out of the puzzle. Like, and that's um, one of the, I think, easier ways to design puzzles that whether they're physical puzzles, like in this case, or they're social puzzles, or you need to, or they're like search-based, you need to find a particular thing to solve the puzzle. Like, you know, you need to find like this particular letter that this one guy has so that you can incriminate him. Um, and then basically whatever the players do, as long as they have a good idea and they roll well enough, they find it. It doesn't matter where it is, like whether they look under, in the toilet, in the in the underwear drawer, in the again in that one stock pot in the kitchen that they never use. <laughs> like it's up there, you know. You can just throw it in wherever. And same thing with this with this puzzle. Like in this crushing room puzzle, there's say there's say there's four party members. And there's five openings in the room on the walls. And they have different glyphs that are numbered. I don't know. <laughs> or maybe you wait and they have, you just say that there's glyphs. And either, then the, if the players are boring and they just say, oh, I want to investigate the glyphs, try to figure out what they are, then you can just say something like, oh, yeah, they're. Um, they're in celestial or giant or whatever. Or let's say this is a cobalt dungeon. They're in draconic. They're numbers. One to five. Okay. Then the player, and then that's all you give them. And then the players have to figure something out. Maybe, you know, they come up with, okay, we all have to hit the buttons at, uh, in sequence. And that's kind of boring, but maybe that works. Or maybe, or maybe you let them, whatever it is they come up with first, unless it's really cool, you don't let the first solution work. So they have to hit the buttons in sequence, and it doesn't work. Hmm. Now they're thinking, and you describe how the ceiling is getting lower and lower. 
and maybe you got a big dude at the party that's like eight feet tall, and it's starting, it's about three inches away from his head, something like that, to ratchet up the tension. Okay, well now the player's like, oh fuck, maybe we have to, maybe the numbers are a decoy, and we have to hit them simultaneously, but, oh no, there's only four of us, and there's five of these things, and, you know, maybe you write it specifically so that there's always one more than whatever the party is. So they all, like, get into position, one through four, like, one, one through four, and then, like, how are we going to hit that other one? Well, they could use a ten-foot pole, like, you know, the strong guy with a ten-foot pole, he can hit both buttons at, at once. Maybe the, uh, the sorcerer just uses mage hand, and he does it that's easy enough. That can be a fun way. Or, you know, whatever crazy solution they come up with, come up with. Maybe the sorcerer doesn't have mage hand. And instead, the cleric has to use a spiritual weapon to, um, to hit the, hit the thing. Because that's the only way they can do it. Or, like, the rogue has, like, throws a dagger at the other button and times it and they have to time it specifically, and then, you know, everybody just makes a reasonably, uh, a reasonable DC, like a DC 12 dex, or sleight of hand, or whatever check, to time it. And that could be fun. And, and mostly, you just, uh, you're just avoiding the, uh, whatever their first solution is, so that it forces them to like, okay, that didn't work. What else could it be? Because that's what you want them to do for a, like a puzzle especially like a, a puzzle trap. You want them to go like, oh fuck, okay, that didn't work. What else could it be? And they're scrambling and trying to figure that out. Unless they have a really good idea that first time. Especially if that idea is, I want to drop a fireball on the ceiling. <laughs> okay, you waste your third level spell slot and you all take damage from this. Sure, that works. <laughs> Traps can be, traps don't have to be physical things either. Maybe it's a, like, trap encounter blend, uh, combat blend, where they walk into a room, and there's a bunch of dudes with crossbows already pointed at them. And then you have, and then the, the bandit leader comes out, and he has to, and he's trying to get you, the party, to give them all their gold, and maybe they'll let them go free. So you have to you have a little opportunity to negotiate with that bandit leader. Maybe, and maybe there's no real way that, um, like, you as the DM, you know, the bandit leader isn't going to just let them walk away. Basically, no matter what they say, unless they, unless, like, you know, you've got a super high charisma bard and warlock in the party that have a bunch of social interaction abilities, and they burn some resources to do something to the leader. Like, let's say, you know, I don't know, they burn a spell that gives you advantage, like, isn't there a 7th or not 8th, ninth level spell, like glibness or something, you can't tell if you're lying, or you've got a college, college of eloquence bar, and I don't know why you use a ninth level spell on this, instead of just shooting them all, but, you know, like, there's some sort of, inter you just want them to have some sort of interaction with this bandit leader, and as long as they negotiate well enough, maybe... Maybe if they negotiate, like, out of their minds, they come up with something amazing, and they roll really well, maybe the bandit leader lets them go free, and you reward them all with some experience. Because in a situation like that, where they avoid a combat, while they save on their resources, it can feel like, okay, well, we could have, if we beat all those bandits, we would have gotten, like, the gold they had, some equipment, some gear, and that feels like missing out sometimes. So you make sure to tell them, like, you're getting extra experience or progress, if you use a milestone. Um, you're getting extra progress for that. But what's likely going to happen is they're going to, if they're trying to negotiate with this bandit captain, and if they negotiate well enough, then he, he, cons he considers for a moment. <clears throat> and you know, and like the whole party notices all the bandits with crossbows aimed at you, they all relax a little bit. And while their crossbows are still armed and generally pointing in your direction, 
their grips are loosened and they're not as focused. You all have one round to do something. So you give them a round to, to, to do something. And that can be like, you know, if they negotiated well enough, okay, now your whole party gets an opportunity to like drop a fireball. The barbarian rages and rushes at the captain. Um, the, like the sorcerer wizard drops a fog cloud on the party to obscure them all. Something like that. any number of different things, like whatever the party comes up with to do. They just get a free surprise round. Just because, and while that doesn't make a huge amount of sense, they all know you're there. So maybe it's not exactly a surprise round, but you get a pre-initiative round. That's probably a better way to work. You all get a free round to do a thing. And then that can give them an advantage going into that combat. That can feel really cool. And that's like a something that's both a trap and a combat encounter at the same time. Um, and then you've got just straight out social encounters. And this can be these can be a little tricky because you know you might have player characters that aren't good at social encounters. They have really low charisma. Well, they can either just assist other characters that are good at it by interjecting little things here and there, or something that. Um, I would be a big proponent of is if a player that's, you know, they don't have high charisma, but let's say they bring up a really strong point about, like, you know, you're trying to convince uh, this, this prince not to go to war or not to decimate this small village or whatever, and you bring up this point, or like your fighter who's not charismatic but he's very knowledgeable in war and these types of things. He brings up this point that that, um, that particular village is very, is like, is well defended because it's at the top of a, a rocky, it's like at the top of a rocky mountain. It's very difficult to get to. It's easily defended. And on top of that, every other year besides this one, they have paid their taxes and dues well on time. They've produced for you. Why should? Why would you punish them for one slight? You know, whatever it is, you should negotiate with them instead. You know. And because of you bring your character brings up those salient military centric points, you let them make a persuasion check, and then, but. They can use their intelligence or wisdom, whatever their stat is higher, and give them proficiency in it, because it's related to their martial abilities. Or say, or you can also drive that point home, make a persuasion check with advantage, and you keep the DC a bit lower, because this character has no bonuses to persuasion. It's This character made a really good argument. So you either, say you give them that persuasion check, or maybe you just let it work. There is no check. That makes a lot of sense. Um, yeah, I guess that's I guess that's all I have to say about traps. I mean, they're pretty simple. They're traps. Um, ideally, again, you want your players to be able to deal with it, so maybe you don't flesh it out all the way. You write in a few little things, and you let the players come up with solutions. Like, later, much later on in their campaign, like, when they're, like, 14th or 15th level, they're, they have some puzzle where, I think, I saw this on Reddit or somewhere, like, you know the solution of the puzzle is, like, you have to set all the clock, the, the, the solution to the riddle is a clock, you know, but then all the players realize that the solution is letting go of their fear of death. That's fucking way better. Do that. Let, let that happen. Let that be the solution. You know, so you come in with, like, a rough idea and see what the players come up with. But sometimes that can get away from you if you have too much going on. Like, if they have to... Like, if they have to investigate a shit ton of different things like seven or eight different things, and 
they don't have a clue about what's going on until they investigate like the fourth or fifth thing. If you don't speed that up, that's going to be really fucking boring for a while. Like, so that, like you know, you have to go over here, you have to go over here, you have to like clear, like investigate this church for something. And you do that, you talk to people, and like you fail a persuasion check, and you get this little item, but you don't know what it is. Unless you can tie that in and make it pay off, like that's not going to be super interesting, I guess. Um, I have some sort of point, but I feel like I'm not communicating it. Super well. Maybe if I come up with it, maybe I'll make it. I'll make an addendum to this one. But that's more or less all I have to say about traps. Um, 